Hello. Hello. Hi. Sally, I see we have you on here twice. What's up yeah. there? I just sent you a text. Uh, okay. I got you. Thanks. Uh, Sally, you can only vote once. I right. know. <laughs> it's very funny. So it's not like northern elections early and often? No. <laughs> and I just I just want to be clear that everybody is aware that there are the three of us on right now at plus Ebenezer and like 22 people uh, from the public. So let me try and open up the Q&A. And for some reason, it's not showing me the participant screen. Ah, there we go. There's a couple hands up already. Excellent. Um, all right, sorry. I'm a little bit delayed. I had some technical difficulties dialing in. I'm just looking through the attendees to see uh, if any of our members uh, are on Tanya, here. Tanya, Natalie, Hoppe family. Yeah. Um, Natalie's not, I'm, I'd be looking to promote the committee members and also, Jennifer, um, can uh, Ebenezer, can you make there's, can you make Jennifer Hoppe? Oh, there we go. Excellent. Hoppe family is Luke, not Jen. I see. You're muted, Jen. Jen, you're muted. I, no, I mean, it's fine if you want to talk. I just can't hear you. My son and some other members of the Inwood, uh, uh, 728 troop are are working on their communications uh, merit badges so they're joining tonight we have public meetings happen oh that's outstanding all right well thank you for that warning i will do my best not to use any Keep of my, PG. yeah any of my characteristically colorful language um thank <laughs> you for that heads up um did uh, they ever do their astronomy thing i saw that they were looking for an astronomer yes uh, can we also, uh, Ebenezer, can you also promote Natalie to a panelist? And uh, sorry for my inability to multitask. I'm hot and cranky. Uh, all right, I'm going to dismiss that. We're going to give this another moment. Uh, Sally, I'm not sure I can find out. Let me know if that noise is too much in the background. Actually, you know what? I don't think it was astronomy. Now that I come to think of it, it was birds. I don't know why I'm confused. Oh, yeah. Them. And I, was, I told really them good. Leslie J and Ken Shaya. Oh, good. Okay. A great yeah, group. Great. I encourage you to continue that conversation uh, offline. I'm going to bring this to order. Uh, it is 636. Are you, are you ready to start, Liz? Are you ready to start? Give me a few seconds when I start recording. Hold on. I'll let you know when you can go when you start the meeting. Hold on. Okay, that's fine. Alexis, are you ready for, um, ouch, for uh, uh, taking minutes? Okay, you're ready to start. We are recording. Okay, Alexis, you're on mute. Are you good with uh, taking minutes? You're ready to roll? Yep, ready to roll. Okie dokie. Welcome everybody to the September uh, Community Board Parks and Community Board 12 Manhattan Parks and Cultural Affairs Committee meeting. Uh, I, am, I am your chair, uh, Liz Ritter, Elizabeth Loris Ritter. Um, we have our assistant chair, Daryl Cochrane, our public member Alexis Marnell, who is taking minutes. Thank you. We've got uh, our committee member Sally Fisher, our borough president uh, liaison Natalie Espino. We've got Jennifer Hoppe from the Parks Department, and we've got looks like about 30 
attendees in the uh, audience, including a couple of people with their hands raised already. I'm assuming that's for the public for the, for the round table session, which we'll get to in a moment. Uh, I'd also like to, uh, can you promote Danielle Jetu, who is a committee member? She should be a panelist. And I also want to um, note that our board member, not a committee member, Tanya Bonner is in the audience. Thank you, Tanya, for coming in. It's always uh, really important when members of the board attend uh, other committees. I appreciate that. So got some updates. One thing that I do want to say is I've gotten a lot of feedback from different people that meetings that go for much over two hours are just kind of exhausting. So I'm trying very hard to end this by 8.30. So help me out by being concise um, and by listening to other people's questions and comments so that if your question is similar to something someone has already asked to just take in the answer to the previously asked question um, and to know that you can always follow up with people after the meeting uh, on the side, we don't have to resolve every everything uh, in the context of, of, uh, of one meeting. So, cause we do meet monthly. So uh, the, the big update on uh, parks usage is that the, the temporary road closures uh, ended as of today, they ended with the summer. So now that Labor Day has come and gone, the uh, Margaret Corbin Drive in Fort Tryon Park is now open to traffic. Um, I've gotten a fair amount of feedback of people who are unhappy about that and a fair amount of feedback of people who are actually happy about that because they like being able to use the road as a road. I understand it's uh, important to the Cloisters, which has now reopened, um, as have many museums for um, limited timed entry. Um, and there are, but I understand that the, the city council's traffic and transportation committee is going to be having a public hearing on not just Margaret Corbin Drive, but on uh, road usage in general uh, both streets that were closed for play streets and, and recreation and to increase social distancing um, as people use parks and open spaces and also the use of roadways as it relates to uh, restaurants and bars uh, so that they can have increased outdoor seating. This is an incredibly important civic issue, but it's actually outside of this committee, it's a traffic and transportation thing. So I give this information to you for your benefit, but it is not a discussion item. Um, I do believe the matter of Margaret Corbin Drive specifically will be on the agenda for the traffic and transportation committee next week. I believe that is Monday the 14th. Um, additionally, also not strictly a parks matter, but something that we did talk about a lot last month at, at our last meeting and the meeting before, Revel Scooters, as you know, they, uh, they ceased operation in the city until they could put into place some better uh, procedures. They have uh, put in some different operating procedures into place and uh, Revel Scooters are back again, this is for your information. This is not an agenda item. Um, I have heard fewer complaints and I personally have observed a few, I haven't seen much activity in the parks. So I don't know, maybe people got the message, but um, I encourage you to continue to uh, phone any complaints that you might have about inappropriate usage, sidewalks, parks, what have you, to um, gorevel.com. Um, and uh, that's all I got on Revel. Um, there have been, over the summer, there were a couple of deaths on, on, in the waterways due to jet skis. And this is sad, this is tragic, this is avoidable, um, but again, not a discussion item 
for this committee. Um, it's essential, it's an, it's, it's an enforcement matter and there isn't, you know, we thought of possibly bringing someone from the um, Coast Guard or from the PD's uh, water, uh, it's like water enforcement. But, I, you know, there isn't, we know what the problem is, they know what the problem is, dragging them to a meeting to have that back and forth didn't seem like a terribly useful, um, a good use of people's time. Um, but I do think that I'm just wondering, Jennifer, is there anything that um, parks concessions are doing? They don't, these aren't, the jet skis aren't a parks concession and they're not, they're, they're buzzing past the marina, this one and the one in Queens, but they're not coming into the marina. So I'm not really sure that's something that your agency gets particularly involved in, yes? You're on mute. Our, our Marine Operations Division does actually get involved in it. The jet skis are prohibited at the Parks Marina. So um, when we see uh, if people are trying to disembark or tie up their jet ski, that is an issue uh, for our marinas, absolutely. And then our Marine Operations Division works with uh, NYPD Harbor Unit and others um, you know, signage, no wake zones. Um, and then when, if there's a meetup planned, we all coordinate. Um, there've been several meetups, uh, large scale events that were planned earlier in the summer that I know they were coordinating on and trying to prevent uh, from impacting the waterfront infrastructure as well as people who are along the waterfront. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm seeing somebody in the, I'm going to address the items in the chat uh, after this section. Um, I just want to go on with the with my uh, report here. Um, I did want to note that the Inwood Rezoning Task Force was uh, it was unanimously approved by the board at um, at our committee of the whole meeting on uh, July 28th that we should have. Uh, and then would, that we should constitute formally the Inwood Rezoning Task Force. The members of that have not been named. Um, so I don't have any update on that beyond that it has been constituted. I am hoping to uh, get some information from on that from the chair at our next meeting. And hopefully there will be, as we had originally conceived of it a couple of years ago when it was first suggested, representation on the task force from each of the committees since the inward rezoning um, affects, uh, there isn't um, an, a, an area of committee work that isn't affected by the rezoning. Um, two other things, sorry, three other things, um, just, uh, nope, I'll circle back on that later, sorry. Um, I heard from Ross Frommer at Columbia University that the, the university's pier at the Muscoda Marsh is due to be replaced. So that is going to be closed while it is being replaced and it should be finished by uh, in time for next season. Um, so we'll be closing, uh, Jennifer, yes. It's actually the Parks Department's dock um, and Columbia okay. maintains it for us, not an important thing, but we are trying to expedite it. It's pending. not an important distinction. Thank you for correcting me. It's the community's doc. Um, we are trying to expedite, uh, expedite work, but it's gonna be contingent upon uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation's moratorium being lifted. Okay, thank you. And when we have, I did encourage Ross to make sure that the university is copious with their signage, explaining you know when it's going to be closed, when they anticipate it being open, just so that people know what's going on. But if uh, if anybody sees that there's work happening, sees that it's closed, this isn't something that's being taken away from the community. This is something that is being fixed and replaced and being restored to the community. So. It's, it's, a, it's a bummer that it'll be offline, but like anything else that needs to be fixed, it'll be nice when it's new and fixed and better and they have committed to having that done in time for next season. Um, Liz, 
Yeah. The, I, I just had a question about that. Do you know where exactly it'll be uh, blocked off? Will people be able to sit in that one area? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, they will. Jen. Just, just the floating dock is okay. going to be uh, uh, repaired. So the fixed dock that's overlooked, you can still use, and the whole rest of the park you can still yeah. use. All of that's going to be completely unaffected. And last but not least, um, oh, welcome, Barbara and uh, Danielle, two of our, uh, Danielle is a member, Barbara had been a member, rotated off to another committee, rotated back on. So uh, nice to have you back. And then I also heard, sorry, passing sign. So I also heard from uh, the parks concessions, the folks at parks concessions. I'm gonna shut. Them. There's a restaurant across the street from me and a lot of double parking. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is an ambulance. Welcome to my world. Um, yeah, he's not moving. He's gonna go on for a while. So the folks at uh, Parks Department Revenue had two updates. One is that um, events for all concessions uh, have been approved, uh, small events, 50 people or less uh, with a variety of, you know, the obvious social distancing requirements. People have to be six feet apart. Um, they have to be wearing masks. Um, so this is for all concessions citywide uh, in parks that they will be able to have small gatherings, what, you know, weddings, bar mitzvahs, anniversary parties, whatever it is that people do when they have small events of 50 people or fewer. Uh, I mentioned this because this applies to, La Mer uh, to uh, the Hudson in the same way that it applies to every other concession. This is not a rule that is particular to the Hudson. This is a rule that is particular to, that applies to every single parks concession. And the rules for the Hudson will be exactly the same as the rules for every other concession. To be clear, I repeat, this applies to every concession in the city. The Hudson isn't being singled out. It isn't getting anything less. It isn't getting anything more. It isn't getting anything different. So there's that. And uh, while I was getting that update, I also asked, well, speaking of concessions, what's going on with the New Leaf Cafe? Um, I, there was a concession, it was RFP, there was, a, as you know, there, uh, it was awarded, things fell through with the awardee, they went to the second awardee, things fell through with that uh, prospective concessionaire, and at that point, uh, the Revenue Division decided to issue a new RFP, and uh, then COVID. So everything just kind of ground to a halt, um, not surprisingly, there are many other priorities citywide than pushing this out the door. Um, so they will be reissuing an RFP. Uh, they don't have a date for it yet. As my mother used to say, no news is no news, but there's nothing happening, not because of a large conspiracy, not because there's uh, any kind of a secret deal. There's just nothing happening. Um, so as soon as I have an update, and hopefully I will have one soon, um, I will provide that to you. Um, I'm going to take Danielle's question, and then I'm going to go quickly to the beginning of the roundtable um, of updates from nonprofits, because I know there are a couple of people who need to leave by seven. So what you got, Danielle? No, just, um, I think I might have missed it. I apologize. You're referring to the concession for Fort Tryon. Right. Yeah, the New Leaf Cafe in Fort Tryon. And if you could turn your mic up, because it's really hard to hear you. Oh. Okay. If, so, if we had questions for Jennifer, should that wait till later? Yes, questions for Jennifer should wait to the portion of Jennifer's presentation. This was my update. So if you have questions for me about the things that I just gave you an update on, ordinarily I would take them now. But as I said, it's 6.52 and there are a couple of people who I know need to uh, go. 
So I'd like to move to agenda item two, the brief programming uh, updates from nonprofits, uh, arts and culture organizations, et cetera, et cetera. And let me just get my timer going and I'm gonna unmute Martin Collins. Um, I don't seem to be able to unmute Martin Collins. Ebenezer, can you give me the ability to, can you elevate me to like co-host so I can unmute people? You got it. Thank you. Okay, Marty, you're on. Good evening, everyone. I have uh, two updates, one from Updater Company and the other from the Northern Manhattan Arts Alliance. On the first, Updater Company launches a series of radio plays starting at 8 p.m. tonight with a new show each Tuesday at 8 p.m. through September 29th. Please see updater.org for info. Thursdays with Northern Manhattan Arts Alliance continues with singer-songwriter Lee Burgos this Thursday, September 10th at 7.30 live on site at Kenyave, 4716 Broadway at Arden Street. Please join us on site to watch and listen to Lee Burgos or on Zoom and Facebook Live. Details to do so uh, on Zoom and Facebook Live on our website, nomanyc.org. Also, Thursdays with Noma features a new artist or performer every Thursday at 7.30 through November 19th. Again, nomanyc.org for info. And two more things from Noma. Please see our newsletter, which came out this afternoon for an update on all of the uh, arts and cultural events uptown. And lastly, NOMA will have a new website debuting shortly. Check out the website, nomanyc.org for info. Thank you, everybody, and enjoy your meeting. Thank you so much, Marty. And if you could shoot me a quick email with uh, those updates so that I can include them in the minutes would be great. Um, thank you. Uh, next up, we have uh, Alex Campos, Campos from the Hispanic Society. Hello, everyone. Good evening. How's there? Can you hear me? Yep. Great. So, you know, we're approaching uh, reopening, everybody, as they're all museums are now. And as you heard in the news, uh, so we're getting closer to that point. And we're actually starting with something outside in conjunction with Hispanic Heritage Month. We are doing an outdoor installation that will be opening September 24th. And we will be doing, uh, it'll be an exhibition in which we are making sure that we take all protocol necessary, COVID protocol necessary. Um, it'll be opened uh, during the day uh, as the gates are open and closed at night. And the, uh, the exhibition is going to feature highlights of our collection. They're not going to be actual works. They're going to be actually um, high-quality, life-size reproductions of certain works from our collection. And we're actually going to have QR codes. So people will walk around, scan the QR codes, and get more personal stories as well as uh, more information about each object. Um, and uh, that's going to be, again, September 24th. We're also planning a series of events in conjunction with Hispanic Heritage Month, including a tertulia on that particular exhibition that we're opening to the public, as well as some public programs, probably a concert and so forth. More to come will be on our website. Uh, later on this year, we plan to open up the Soria Gallery as we had before. And hopefully in the new year, we will open up a temporary exhibition space as well. So we are moving forward. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you so much. Uh, next up, we've got Shiloh Holly from the Morris Jamel Mansion. Hi, um, I have three updates from the Morris Jamel Mansion. Uh, the first is over the next two Thursdays, we are continuing to host our uh, program in conjunction with some other historic house trust pro properties called the Handwriting the Constitution. Uh, it's a creative and reflective workshop where you get to spend time with um, some documents uh, and it's led by artist Morgan O'Hara. This Saturday, we have our upcoming family day. It is a drumming circle within the Aguilar and registration is required. Uh, it'll be social distancing friendly and an on-site event in the park. 
Um, and the third is that our museum reopens this week. Our hours are Thursday through Sunday, Sunday and we have two timed entries per day. Um, and then when we open, we will also open with ex expanded interpretation, new tour offerings, and all interpretive materials available in Spanish. Uh, for more information about that, please visit our website, marsdemal.org, uh, for our uh, to book your tour or uh, more information about our programming. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, I am informed that we've got representatives of the Metropolitan Museum of Art Met Cloisters, uh, Tom Schuler and Griffith Mann. Uh, I'm going to, I'm not seeing where Tom is on the call. Uh, I'm looking for Griff Mann. Okay, you are on. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I just want to announce along with those other institutions that the Met Cloisters is opening uh, this Saturday, the 12th. And we are planning to open on uh, Thursday the 10th for members. Um, so obviously we are interested in uh, New York getting back and the cultural organizations being part of that landscape returning and um, obviously have a, a real interest in Margaret Corbin Drive uh, that I know is on the agenda for later. Um, no, it's actually, it's not, it's not on the agenda for later. I just made an announcement that the road has been open. Okay. Um, and um, that's, although it's a, although it's a road through the park, uh, it's really more of a DOT thing. So I am happy to, uh, uh, was, I can circle back and take some feedback from people to pass on to the traffic and transportation committee. Um, I understand that the, uh, that the Met is obviously strongly in favor of continuing to keep, of, of having the road be open because that's how people access the, uh, the museum. Yeah, one of the issues I would mention that's connected to that is the fact that the elevator uh, at 190th Street is down for repairs. Mm -hmm. So people who are coming to the cloisters from outside of the neighborhood are actually going to be getting off at the 181st Street stop and we've been working with the MTA to ensure that the bus service runs in to the park so that people can arrive at the cloisters uh, and that's also critical for anyone arriving with accessibility issues mm -hmm. um, so yeah we and the you know the the, uh, the roadway obviously is just opened so we've been managing uh, to do our our work without it but we do have staff in the museum even when it's closed and deliveries and contractors coming and going so um, we are very keen to see the roadway open up. Okay, thank, thank you. you. And um, hello, 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 Tom, if you're out there. Oh, Tom, lovely to hear your voice, yes. No, that was probably just me oh. asking your questions. <laughs> oh, good guy, though you I, sound like Tom. Though I, do, hi Tom, if you're around. Uh, but no, I was wondering if maybe too, they're working, since folks will be walking from probably the 184th uh, entrance, uh, working with the restaurants too on the way there would be great, or at least to tell people, you know, where they could go eat on their way back from the Yes. Um, do you have a uh, space in your front area for little palm cards from local restaurants, that kind of thing? Are you talking about the placers? Yeah. Uh, we can look into that, but we do, especially with the uh, with the new leaf. We, you know, we'd love to be able to spread the words about restaurants in the neighborhood that people should go to. A lot of people, when they're leaving the cloisters, will actually be going down towards Dykeman, mm -hmm. um, as well as back towards the, um, you know the 181st Street stop. Right. Particularly, I mean, now that that beautiful staircase is done, the new leaf, yes. of course, is closed. But um, the you know there are there's. There's no uh, paucity of restaurants in the Dykeman area or on the 187th Street corridor. So uh, to the extent that you can work with them to promote that would be would be great. Um, yeah, I can speak to our visitor experience staff about that. And I myself uh, rent an apartment in the neighborhood. So um, I always like to support local businesses. Excellent. Visitor experience staff. That's a wonderful <laughs> name for uh, a function. I like that. 
Okay, um, we have uh, Anastasia Galco from Riverside Park Conservancy. Uh, um, hello everyone, thanks for the time. This is Anastasia. I'm gonna give you three quick updates and if you wanna stay in the loop or you have more questions, you can just email me. I don't know, Liz, if you wanna just put that in the notes or something. Um, so yeah, on Tuesday, September 15th, we will be announcing the progress that we've made so far on the North Park Initiative this year. Um, it will be on our social media and on our website. Again, you can email me if you wanna tune in. There are some park improvements on the horizon between 120th to 181st. Super exciting, looking forward to that. On Saturday, uh, September 19th, there's a coastal cleanup at 145th, which I know is a little south for you guys, but I figured I'd shoot it out there just in case. Mm -hmm. um, and potentially also at West Harlem Piers, potentially also at 172nd TBD. Again, email me and that will be made clear in the next week. And then on Saturday, 926, there is a project at 151st Street. Same thing, a little far south. Uh, we will need RSVP because we are capping group size in order to have social distancing be possible. Um, and yeah, I, I hope to hear from some of you guys. Thank you. Um, can you do me a favor and put your, I don't have the ability to put your information in the chat in that same way. Um, yep. So if you could throw your contact information in the chat would be uh, excellent. That's in the Q and A, right? Yes. Oh, got you. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Um, also, um, Shiloh, can you just, uh, what's, what's the time for that dying circle that you mentioned? Sorry, I had to unlock my phone. Uh, it is uh, Saturday at 1. By which I meant drumming circle, of course. Yep. Yes, we're not, I didn't hear we're, that. Not, we're not dying, we're drumming. Yep, yeah. and uh, registration can be found on our website. Excellent. I'm sorry, what time was it? Uh, I missed it. What time? 1 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Okay. I'm sorry, I have one more question for uh, Anastasia. What was the event on 919? I don't know if I'm unmuted. Um, yeah. What was the event you said for 919? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's a coastal cleanup. So we'll be doing trash pickup, which is clearly very needed if anyone's been at the parks recently. Yes. And that's going to be at which section? Definitely 145th Street on the shore, if not also West Harlem Piers, and also potentially 172nd. Thank you. And just for people who are curious, Thank you. I, I understand that 145th Street is outside of Community Board 12, but that area um, just south of uh, where Community Board 12 ends is an area that uh, folks within the board, particularly at the southern end of the board, use a lot. So I feel like community interest is better served by not being so precise about like, it's 155th Street, that's where it ends and we don't care about anything south of that. So the, the borders and the parks are a little bit more fluid. I'm gonna move to uh, Aaron Sims from Inwood Artworks. Hello everybody, how's everyone doing tonight? Well, thanks for having me today. Um, happy, I guess, almost fall. Um, so, uh, Inwood Artworks, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, mission is to create and curate professional performing and visual arts in Inwood and surrounding community. Uh, and that definitely applies to Washington Heights and also in the Northwest Bronx. Uh, just the four programs we have going on this month, uh, there's a lot. Um, so just give you the bullet points. Every Tuesday, today, you could log into our YouTube channel and see a musical story time for kids. Uh, sung by some of our uptown artist families. Today we're highlighting favorite things from The Sound of Music, which is great. Um, twice a month on Wednesday nights, uh, we are doing Lost Inwood Video Vault uh, about Inwood history and North Manhattan history. Tomorrow we're doing a documentary on votes for women in uptown history of women's suffrage. It's a very short documentary created by Cole Thompson. 
Uh, and then on the 23rd, we're doing a, a sort of documentary on Uptown's Forgotten Slave Cemetery. So just bringing it to your attention. Um, on Thursdays, every Thursday this month, we're having uh, our podcast, uh, which is in available on our YouTube channel in video form and also available on Apple Music, Spotify, and our Inwood Artworks website and wherever you get your podcasts from. Uh, this Thursday, we highlight local painter Alisa Gore, who many of you know from her works in the parks. Um, we are uh, have two Metropolitan Opera singers, Lori and Mary Phillips, on the 17th, and then uh, fight choreographer, local artist David Anzuelo will be also featured on the 24th. Uh, and last but not least, we, every Friday uh, since March, Inwood Artworks has featured a local film since we had to postpone the Inwood Film Festival. So we've been showcasing a local filmmaker and their film every Friday, and also pairing that with local businesses that are open. Um, this freaking Friday here, we have 9-11, uh, we have We Quahik by Jamie Rudy, and uh, we're featuring Booty Coffee and Kiro Curran. Uh, if you have a in the neighborhood and like us to feature you, it's absolutely free, gratis. We're happy to tell the world you're out there and open. And if we can help you out, we will. So it's all available on our social channels. It's all free. And um, we just want to keep spreading the positivity and the creativity in the neighborhood. Thank you. So thank you. I'm going to have to cut you off here because you're over your time. But thank you very much. You got in what Artworks does a huge amount of stuff. Um, I do hope you're able to stay on the call because one of the things that I'm hoping um, Jennifer will be able to address during her uh, report, which is coming up soon, is um, when the Parks Department will be contemplating uh, permitting, per uh, permitting events in parks. Uh, it seems to me that a properly managed, socially distanced, I don't know, outdoor film night is probably safer than the unmasked, undistanced partying that's happening in parks. So, you know, there may be some, um, you can hopefully give us an update, uh, an update on that during your uh, report. If there are other people, I see a couple of hands up. Hold on, Sally. Uh, I see a couple of hands up in the audience from Cynthia Auburn and from Tanya Bonner. I'm assuming that your comments are relating not to uh, nonprofit cultural Friends of Parks groups, but to parks conditions generally, which is coming up later in the agenda. Um, I've got Bob Barnett. Uh, Bob, did you have your hand up to give a, a report from Hudson River Community Rowing? I mean, Harlem River Community Rowing? Very briefly, um, we had hoped to do a very simple singles program this, uh, this fall, and we had been in conversations with parks. Of course, we were going to use the dock. <laughs> which has since been, um, for very good reasons. I, we were, one of our members has actually inspected the dock and also recognized that it was in um, great shape. But we have pivoted that we're going to be um, offering uh, this Saturday an online um, a training program or, or exercise program specifically targeted for uh, rowers, um, our participants, people that we've worked with in the community in the past uh, years uh, in Inwood. Um, that will be advertised. And depending on the response, we're hoping to go forward and doing a, a, a more weekly uh, type of online or else in parks, if indeed we're able to, you know, permitting, um, permitting, 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 permit, permits, uh, we'll be able uh, to do something like that through, the, through October. Uh, but we're still maintaining our commitment to the community and uh, finding ways to husband our resources as best as possible so that when the new dock is in place, we're able to return and once more offer free programming in the community. That's Fantastic. It. Fantastic, thank you very much, I appreciate it. Um, Obed Folkar, you had mentioned that you had contacted me earlier to say that you had a quick update from uh, your organization. Uh, yes. Uh, hi. Good evening, everybody. Obed Fulker, Friends of Sherman Creek. Uh, quick update. Uh, we've been, uh, this is the last time we started to get the park. Now that the parks are open, the Sherman Creek Waterfront Park, we are actually conducting a, a 
community cleanup event uh, Saturday. It's going to be a combination of Eastmore Park Day at City of Water, celebrating Waterfront Alliance, uh, celebration of all things water. And the uh, story, we're going to be from 11 to 3 p.m. We're going to be doing some planting, uh, some uh, mulching, and a general cleanup of the, of the shoreline. We are a, a keeping the mandate of social distance, wearing masks, and we're actually getting a toolkit from Punish for Parks, yay, where we're gonna be handing out to park users and uh, masks and, and you know, all paraphernalia will keep, uh, is, we'll plant and beautify parks. Uh, yeah, Saturday, this coming Saturday, uh, September 12th from 11 to 3 p.m. Everybody's welcome to come and join us, get down and dirty. Excellent, thank you so much. No problem. Uh, okay, are there any other organiz Oh, Veronica Lou from Word Up. What's up? Hey, um, I just wanted to say hello um, and let everyone know that we've had, um, we have coming up on Saturday, a school supply giveaway, voter registration, do the census event um, this Saturday, the 12th, 1 to 4 p.m. Uh, we'll also be doing census stuff every Tuesday um, outside the store. Um, you know, up till early August, we were doing a ton of online events. And through these programs and summer camps, we give away, you know, a thousand plus books, new books um, to anyone joining the book clubs and the camps and everything. But um, there have been a couple of like, you know, outside socially distanced masked events that we've done. Um, and this this September, we're focusing them all on making sure that uh, people do the census um, and coupling it with um, letting people get getting, letting people know about the community fridge that is now at uh, the corner of 165th and Amsterdam Avenue. Um, you know, people have been coming and filling it up and then people have been taking the food away and it's been this wonderful flow of things just like, just like the books that are now pay what you can outside of the shop and hope to see people soon. I have a question. Uh, how are people, I'm sorry, how, how do people uh, donate to the community fridge? Like what are the parameters there? rules yes um there's when, do, when is the drop off yeah i can i can share maybe this is a maybe a good spot to or someone i can share that there's like an faq document um of the kinds of food that can go in and the kinds of food that is not accepted um and then other people have been just sending money through paypal or venmo to the person running the fund and then other people you know then do the the picking up of the food. Um, there's been, you know, partnerships built with some of the people at the farmers markets and some of the other CSAs. So, you know, the regular pickups throughout the week that happen for that. Um, but yeah, either through monetary donations or through, um, and, and the kinds of, you know, you could just walk by and like leave food in there, but as long as they sort of fit the guidelines, there are people checking on it on a regular schedule. And for the most part, they are not people who, they're people who we've like met throughout the pandemic, but are not people who were already previously board up volunteers. Um, so it's a whole other volunteer crew that we're also a part of, you know, the word up volunteers, but um, it's sort of twice the, um, Overseeing, you know, this is a, it's an expanded group overseeing. It. If you could, Veronica, if you could send that, to me, I will share it with the committee. Um, at, but I am assuming, in a nutshell, we're talking about packaged, sealed foods, not things that are. Home yeah, everything should be labeled, um, packaged, and you know, with with uh, you know, ideally, if it could be labeled bilingually, that'd be even better. Um, but in a lot of produce um, and uh, things that, you know, are easily identifiable, nothing that's already, you know, partially eaten, nothing expired, nothing homemade at this time. Um, some restaurants have been starting to do, um, you know, pass things along, but those things have come labeled too, like prepared food. Um, well, it's cold. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, cold? Liz, I had a question about that. Oh, okay. Um, 
Yes, briefly. I'm sorry, I think Daniela. Daniela was first. Danielle? Oh, I was just gonna ask. I mean, you can you you can go ahead, Daryl, if you want. Um, it was sort of related to that comment um, about the refrigerator and the giving and taking in it. Maybe. Okay, I just want to the the community fridge is a wonderful idea. I support it. I love it. I'm happy. It's a thing. I encourage people who have questions about it to reach out to Veronica directly. It's not a parks and cultural affairs initiative. So if you've got a lot of questions about the community of fridge. Oh, no, I don't. Turn, if you could uh, throw your my, contact information up into the chat, that would be great. My, my question was just simply if people that are utilizing the fridge are maybe getting uh, information on other resources in the community for whatever other needs they may have. And as you know, I'm unable to put in the chat. So that was my question. Uh, we have, uh, maybe not directly at the fridge, we have, um, you know, there's stuff posted all over the outside of the storefront because we have the nice advantage of big windows where there's big bulletin boards for, you know, what to do if, you know, you're, country, you're experiencing domestic violence, there's uh, information about the census, there's information about stuff that's in the windows, We're, we'll happily put up more. Okay, thank you. And if you can put up um, your contact information, Vern, in the chat, that's what I meant. I know that the panelists can't put their questions in the chat, but uh, if you could put your contact information in the chat would be great. And then send me that flyer and I will forward it to the committee. Um, I've got a question in the chat um, based on the time asking about where the cleanup is on Saturday. Um, I'm assuming that is directed to uh, Obed at Sherman Creek. So Obed, I'm gonna unmute you briefly so that you can give us some information on when, uh, on where people should be meeting up for that cleanup on Saturday. Yes, uh, meeting point will be uh, the water, Sherman Creek Waterfront Park at 203rd, 10th Avenue on the Holland River. That's where we're gonna be meeting and uh, there will be tents, tables for physical distance. I don't like the social distance term because we are all socially connected, yeah, physically. And yeah, that's the meeting point at, for, at 11. And feel free to call one hour, what, as much as you can, stay for the day, for the whole duration. 11 to 3 p.m., 203rd Street and 10th Avenue. Super, thank you so much, I appreciate thank it. Thank you, Liz, appreciate it. Okay, uh, going once, going twice, any, oh, Sally, Liz, I didn't get to finish my question before. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, I think you thought it was going to be about the fridge. It was. I, I was I trying to say that it was it's really hard to hear you. I don't know why. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay, I was saying that it's along the same vein as like the give and take with the refrigerator, but pertaining to books in the parks i was wondering if we've ever discussed the idea of having like like what they have set up on um dykeman and broadway sort of like a a book library in the parks in inwood i think the issue is maintaining um the bookshelves and whether or not they're protected from the weather because that's been an issue with all of the public bookshelves i mean that's one issue that i can think of immediately yeah, I've seen them before in other cities where they have them in like an enclosed sort of situation. But I guess, you know, just wondering if that's something that like is possible, if we've ever discussed. Yes, Jennifer. We, we I know there was one at Indian Road right at the entrance to Inwood Hill Park. There still is. Um, I'm not sure who maintains it. And then there also was one uh, at, at Bennett Avenue at the A train entrance, it's also gone. I think to Sally's point, a lot of the times they just, they deteriorated. It's something else to maintain. Um, if a group comes to parks, um, we pilot it. And um, what tends to have worked well is if it's smaller scale, not people coming and dumping their bookshelves, you know. Um, Bennett Park, we have one, the Little Free Lending Library, and it probably holds about 20 books. Um, otherwise, at, a, at the other locations, we get, we've gotten dumping. 
Uh, at the Morris Jamel Mansion in Roger Morris Park, there's also a little library that uh, is there in conjunction with the program through Word Up. Cool. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, Sally. Okay, a couple of events. I'm, I'm going to speak for two organizations, maybe three if there's time. The first is Friends of Inwood Hill Park. Um, I Just a shout out to the parks, parks maintenance workers who are doing a great job despite losing all their seasonal staff. Um, and also two groups that have joined us in half a dozen cleanups, especially the parks maintenance workers. The, there's a um, group of Hispanic youth from all over the city called Communify. They've done a couple cleanups with us, Senator Jackson's office. Um, and most recently, I think last weekend, um, a group that, a volunteer group that grew out of the Greenbelt Nature Center. So I wanna thank everybody for that. The next event that we have, um, and I'd encourage people to keep in touch with our Facebook page, is on the 26th of this month. Um, it's a plogging event. Um, it, plogging, for those of you who don't know it, is sort of a combination of jogging and the Swedish term, um, and I won't pronounce it right, which is pika up, which means pick up. Um, and basically um, getting exercise while you're cleaning up whatever route you're running or jogging, or in my case, I'll probably be plogging which is picking up and walking. Um, so that's on the 26th. And the next huge event that we have um, is on the 17th of October. That is the annual river sweep, um, typically held the first weekend of May, which was postponed for obvious reasons. Um, this will be, I think, our third or fourth year doing it as Friends of Inwood Hill Park in conjunction with other groups. The, um, we've done two sites. One is the Dykeman Pier. Um, I always like cleaning up at the river because then it doesn't end up in the belly of some fish. Um, and also at the northern, at the top of Inwood Hill Park. Um, and that's with Leslie Burby and crew. Um, those announcements will go online on the 17th of this month and you'll be able to sign up. There will be sites for those of you who don't live in Inwood. Um, there are sites all over the city. Um, next, um, and then the other thing I just wanted to mention is to 30 seconds because that, that, that dinger was your time. So, okay. um, we have equipment that we can loan to groups that want to do their own cleanups. We've loaned them to Uptown Dreamers for their Harlem and Washington Heights cleanup. Finally, the Washington Heights Food Council, um, has been doing a plant-based nutrition series and that will continue this Sunday. It's called Food for Life. It's a, a, it's a curriculum developed by the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. The next session um, is this coming Sunday, as I said, and the focus will be foods for a healthy weight. You can find out more on the Washington Heights Inwood um, website or Facebook page. And that's it since I'm wrapping up. Cool. I'm wrapped up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer? Just before the parks report, one cultural thing. Um, People perhaps have seen it. Uh, the Parks Department had planted a grove for Juneteenth at Cadman Plaza um, back in June. And as part of that 19 flowering trees were planted and 19 benches were painted in the Pan-African flag colors. Um, the Parks Department now in concert with partners, um, we've been uh, sort of spreading that temporary public art uh, project throughout the city. Um, right near where Friends of Inwood Hill Park help us at Inwood Hill. Uh, we have a new bench by the Farmer's Market at Isham Park. We have a new bench. There'll be one going in at Fort Tryon, um, at Broadway and Arden Street. Uh, the Dykeman Farmhouse has one and we're working with Shiloh to have one at, at Roger Morris Park. Um, and those will be up through um, uh, December 31st. It's part of sort of a larger um, initiative on the Parks Department's, uh, led by the Parks Commissioner, um, declaring solidarity with the Black community. Um, November 2nd, there's going to be another piece uh, rollout of it um, with some park renamings. But um, if you're wondering what those benches are around, um, and there's a, a great press release on the Parks Department's uh, website about it. And one other cultural event coming up, it's Fort Tryon Park's 85th anniversary and the Fort Tryon Park Trust is having uh, an opportunity to travel back in time, 85 years of the Olmsted legacy at the Heather Garden, um, October, uh, September 15th at 6.30 p.m. Uh, with the public garden designer Rhonda M. Brands talking about the Olmsteds then, 
what we know now about invasives and how we carry on their legacy, but keep the park and its ecology thriving. Thank you. Um, Natalie, you wanna give us a quick uh, a plug for the census? Always, I live to give plugs for the census. I know you do. So yes, um, this is something that may not on the surface look like relate something that is related to uh, the, this committee, but uh, we all know that the importance of being counted, of having every member of our community counted, of having resources allocated and representation in government determined uh, by an accurate count of everybody, of every sort, of every age, of every national origin uh, in this beautiful community of Washington Heights Inwood um, is it's crucial and it affects every sector. Um, and there are citywide uh, there is right now a group of cultural organizations under the hashtag uh, culture counts um, that you know are arts organizations that have mobilized uh, to make sure that people who follow and support the arts realize the importance of uh, being counted uh, to for the ongoing support of arts and culture uh, of, of arts and culture and as we know as well as the parks so, the government has shortened the response time. We all know this, something cheeky happened. I don't wanna speculate, but we only have about 23 days left to respond to the census. So make sure that every conversation you have, even if it is about uh, teacups or wing nuts, uh, includes a plug for the census. Thank you all so much. Outstanding, census, census, census. I see Manhattan is up to 56%. So, which is better than it was, but not as good as it could be. Um, okay, I have, I don't really know, I, I can't really screen share in any kind of um, easy way that's not gonna cause everybody's um, uh, squares to disappear. So I just wanna give you a brief roadmap of the rest of the meeting. Uh, I believe that is it for um, announcements from parks and cultural uh, groups. Um, we're gonna have Jennifer's parks report, which will include some of the questions that people have been throwing up in the chat. I'm not ignoring you. I'm just trying to keep things orderly. Um, and then we're going to have um, a discussion of our capital and expense budget priorities. Uh, I think some of the lingering questions from some of the things that I'd spoken about in my update kind of fit into uh, Jennifer's Parks report. So I would like to turn the, the Zoom over to Jennifer for that. Um, oh, wait a minute, just before I, before I cue you, uh, I just wanna make note of anonymous attendee made some comments about motorbikes in and around parks. Um, in Inwood, a couple in Inwood Hill Park, one in Central Park. Um, so yeah, if you can possibly address what the enforcement issues are there. Um, thank you anonymous attendee for that. Um, and we've got uh, we've got some questions in the chat about the about the road, uh, which again I will be passing all of that information on to um, the Traffic and Transportation Committee. Um, but I think that's that's although it is a road in the park, it's large. The decision on that is largely outside of uh, parks purview. That's done through the mayor's office. And can people see these questions in the chat? Are these publicly visible? So I don't have to like read out that information. Excellent, I'll shut up now. Jennifer. Hi everyone. Um, just before I forget, this doesn't affect everyone, but it does affect many of you. A lot of people, more people are using the, the 10 miles of trails in Inwood Hill Park. Um, we have had, oh, it doesn't work. <laughs> Obviously, we've had um, the Department of Health has notified us that we've had another two incidents of rabies. 
um, in uh, the uh, raccoon and skunk population. Uh, one was in the street network, um, not in the parks, but east of Fort Tryon, and one was along Payson Avenue. Um, the urban park rangers have done uh, some public education as a result up at uh, Muscoda Marsh Park where people are unfortunately feeding feral cats and thereby attracting raccoons and uh, someone was bitten. Um, we've got signs up at key park entrances, um, but I just wanna remind everyone to keep your dogs on leash um, uh, and to be mindful if you see a raccoon that, or a skunk that seem lethargic or overly aggressive, uh, please call it into 311 so that the Department of Health and the, the Parks Department's Wildlife Division can respond and address it, um, isolate the, the animal and test if, if warranted. Um, so please be, be mindful um, and please keep your, your dogs uh, on leash, probably both in and outside of the parks because these are actually park exterior and, and outside of them. Um, I also wanted to let people know uh, that the Parks Department has launched a new uh, campaign. Um, we need everybody's help to show your park some love. Uh, as you can all imagine, with COVID, uh, our parks are seeing probably some of their highest visitorship they've seen in ages. Everyone is uh, using the parks for physical activity, for uh, getting together with family, uh, safe social distancing, um, for protests, um, for uh, you know graduation photos with the family, uh, you name it. Uh, outside office, um, it's it's all happening in the parks. Uh, as a result, we're seeing a a, a lot more uh, garbage in the parks. With the um, the city's um, nine billion dollar budget deficit, uh, there's been. Uh, budget cuts of $84 million to the Parks Department's budget. Um, that means that we're dealing with um, a staffing reduction of 1,700 people. So at a time when we've got higher volumes of park use, we don't have uh, the seasonal staff that we normally would have to address that. That said, um, thank you, Sally. Um, our staff have been uh, working diligently to try to keep up with it all. Um, coming in at six over the weekend, handing out bags. Um, it's definitely a lot to deal with on top of all the illegal dumping and other things that happen at our parks. Um, so we need everybody's help. Um, our elected officials have been doing uh, neighborhood cleanups in the streets and at park perimeters. Um, the Natural Areas Conservancy, Friends of Inwood Hill Park, the Fort Tryon Park Trust. Uh, we'd love everybody's help to, to toss your trash where you can use reusable materials if you're going to picnic with your family and take them out of the park bring a bag and uh, take the trash to the can um, if the can is overflowing put your bag next to the can um, and encourage your neighbors uh, to help keep our neighborhood clean because it definitely takes a village when we're all uh, spending so much more time outside uh, trying to escape being cooped up in apartments. Um, and I wanted to give this community board a shout out. Um, as many of you, you know, we don't necessarily have, you know, a second shift afternoon staff. Um, the community board members have gone out into the parks at night when people are gathering and hand out bags and talking to their neighbors. And that's great. Uh, it really um, helps extend uh, the parks department's efforts. So thank you for that and be on the lookout for um, new flyers, uh, stickers. We've had more trash cans out in the park, uh, more coming. Um, we've gotten more equipment for dealing with trash, but not additional staff. So that, that's definitely a challenge. Um, so love your park, toss your trash. Um, our parks are also being used for the outdoor learning initiative um, that the mayor announced. We've got schools that I think we have about 185 schools so far that are gonna be taking advantage of Uptown's uh, abundant parkland um, for outdoor learning, outdoor physical education, whatnot. You said how many schools? 
uh, not just 185 in District 6, it's 185 citywide. Uh, so the parks are being used for outdoor learning. We are going to have some additional roadway closures for outdoor learning. Uh, the mayor's street activity permit office is working on those. And then of course we have the play streets. Um, so uh, the city's working hard to try to accommodate as many people as we can outside. Um, special event permits right now, it, it is up to 50 people. You do have to submit a, um, a safety plan to go along with that, to show how you're um, dealing with crowd management and uh, protecting public health. Uh, no amplified sound is being permitted though. So if you hear amplified sound, absolutely call it in. It's not, um, it's not approved in any instance. Um, as you know, uh, schools and league sports for, for kids and youth um, is back on the table. Permits are being issued for those. Um, uh, the fall season starts next Tuesday for youth baseball, softball, non-contact lacrosse, uh, flag football. Uh, we know people need to get out and play. Um, some facility updates. Um, Shyla mentioned earlier with the mansion reopening, Roger Morris Park is also open and available to the public uh, Thursdays through Sundays, 10 to five. Uh, and Muskoda Marsh has that one uh, temporary closure. Uh, we have some areas that are still closed off from the first storm. And then we've had subsequent storm damage from the second storm. Some areas may still not be accessible. We're working with the forestry division on that. Um, so if you see caution tape wrapped around a tree or a gate still closed, uh, please be patient. Um, they had thousands and thousands of tree service requests. Um, capital projects update, um, as many people can imagine, with COVID, several of our projects were halted uh, during the construction moratorium. Things have, uh, uh, have restarted as uh, the COVID conditions have improved, certain safety pr protocols have been put in place. Um, High Bridge, the $5 million water tower reconstruction has resumed. Um, still getting a sense of how that's affected the construction schedule, which I can report to the committee on at a later date. Um, the $30 million anchor parks project has resumed. Um, phase two of that, as this committee knows, includes an, a new four and a half million dollar artificial turf soccer field. Uh, during our planning meetings, we had lots of demand for more soccer. That's gonna be coming online probably by the month's end, which we're really excited about, 175th in Amsterdam. Um, and then the uh, uh, adventure playground uh, is probably um, is resumed and that's probably gonna become available, um, I'd say around Halloween. Uh, weather and other conditions allowing. And then the Laurel Hill Terrace Staircase, which this committee also advocated for, um, has resumed. Um, and um, let's see, probably it's gonna be completed by the end of the year. Uh, at Audubon Playground, the Community Parks Initiative site uh, that this committee also advocated for uh, constructions resumed. We have a series of safety inspections. We're hoping we want to get that site or portions of it available to the two adjacent schools in time for school reopening September 21st. So that's our aim. Um, but that'll be uh, good news. The comfort station was bid separately. So that uh, will be happening at a later date. But construction has resumed there as well. Um, we are still, I know, since I know Sally's going to ask. <laughs> We're still waiting for OMB to green light. Um, some of the projects uh, where we awarded uh, to contractors um, like Ann Loftus Playground and the Inwood Nature Center. Um, since those contracts hadn't been registered with the controller yet, they're sort of in holding pattern still with the city's office of management and budget. Um, and, and that's actually the case with several of our projects. Um, but I won't, I won't go into all of them because I, I know you want to do your, your uh, budget priorities. Um, I did um, want to say we've got um, some additional stewardship days coming up, three at Inwood Hill Park. Um, 
if you want to work in the forest, which continues uh, to be amazing. Um, Park Stewardship has a day coming up uh, September 17th from 9 to 12, um, and also on September 26th. If you don't want to go to Sally's Plogging event, or if you want to, if you want to work up in the woods, uh, 9 to 12 on the 26th. And then with Partnerships for Parks, there's going to be, if you don't want to work in the forest, but you want to help clean up uh, and be an ambassador in the, in the regular areas of the park, that's on uh, probably on September 20th, and that's going to be in the afternoon and evening. Um, for Tryon Park, we've got three upcoming stewardship days uh, this Saturday from 10 to 1 on Broadway and Arden Street. Also on September 26th, um, Broadway and Arden again, 10 a.m., and on September 20th at 10 a.m. at uh, Margaret Corbin Circle. Um, so, uh, questions. So, the on just on the revel, I, somebody in the motorbike issue. So, something to keep in mind is yes, go revel.com. If you see somebody abusing a revel, either driving on the sidewalk or driving on a park path, take a photo of the license plate and send it to revel they'll revoke that person's um, uh, what, subscription uh, for violations. Um, many people have asked if park enforcement is doing anything about the motorbikes and the Revel scooters. Um, as a matter of principle, um, the Parks Department, park, uh, peace, and peace officers and the NYPD will not give chase to a motorized vehicle on a pedestrian path. Um, does not end well. And I guess as a matter of practice, it, uh, it ends up, it could potentially end up hurting unsuspecting pedestrians on those paths. So what tends to happen is um, if uh, PEP is patrolling a site and they see a Revel scooter inside a playground, or if they're patrolling a site and they see the Revel scooter parked at the tennis court, then they can issue a summons because obviously you had to drive it on the park path to, to get there. Um, but the pedestrian safety really has to be uh, a priority um, on the pedestrian paths. Um, there was another question. Uh, um, there were a couple of specific, very specific questions. Um, uh, so I'm seeing one. Inoculating for rabies, prophylactic inoc inoculation for rabies. So the Parks DOMH brought back its prophylactic rabies inoculation program, the relative cost of this program versus rabies treatment. Right. I don't know what the relative cost is. Uh, as you may know, if you've attended meetings in the past, we've done two rounds of with the DOH um, and NYC Wildlife the uh, um, of inoculating the um, uh, skunks and raccoons when they when they can obtain them. They also have done two rounds of the prophylactic. Um, they look like the ketchup packets. They don't hurt dogs. Dogs, you know, if they eat two, they'll vomit it up, but they'll remain safe. But they do keep the, they do end up inoculating the animals from rabies. So that has two rounds of that has already been done. Um, I can go back to wildlife and see if sort of a, a certain threshold has been met where they deem that that would, will be, uh, is necessary. Um, okay. um, there's also, there's a question, there's a question about part, uh, cleaning schedules, posting the cleaning schedules in the bathrooms, uh, specifically the bathroom in the Hudson River Greenway Park off, off of uh, 157th Street is not being cleaned. I mean, I know that there are staffing issues, but I think just having um, the CAT 158's point that having the schedule be posted is useful. Okay. So I can ask, um, that site is administered by the Riverside Park uh, Administrator and Fort Washington Park Administrator, so I can ask them if they can post it. Okay, um, but, I, but if, the, if, if it can be posted for others as well, I'm just gonna go through some of these other questions okay. before I hit you, uh, Danielle, um, that would be useful. Um, there's also a, a question about parks enforcement personnel uh, I'm going to paraphrase this because it gets to a larger, a larger point. Uh, would it help if parks enforcement personnel were working at night when littering occurs and handing out tickets? Um, so, if you could speak a little bit about 
what the staffing is for PEP, what their scheduling is, um, and how best to you know leverage that limited resource. Um, sure. So the Park Enforcement Division schedules do change. Um, there, there are things uh, we do special operations. If we're doing a joint uh, outreach for an encampment, you know, people may change their schedules to be with uh, Department of Homeless Services or GUHMH when we're doing that outreach. Um, we do have two tours. Um, one uh, during the day at time hours where you know public education can happen. Um, we can prevent certain things from being set up to begin with. Um, and then there's the later shift uh, and staff are on till 10. Periodically we do do, if we're doing a, a joint operation with the NYPD, again, schedules will be changing. Sometimes those are overnight depending on what type of condition it is uh, that um, they're responding to. Um, but it's right now, um, the, there are two shifts in uh, Northern Manhattan parks um, and North Manhattan parks. The, the park enforcement um, uh, pod that is based out of Highbridge serves all, all of the parks, not just Northern Manhattan parks, 660 acres, everything down to 110th street. Um, and I think there are two sergeants, seven officers and two officers in training. Um, so they're covering quite a bit of uh, land. Um, so there are two things that um, are helpful for that. Uh, generally patterns, if people are, call in your conditions to 311. Um, even if they're not able to respond right then, same with central communications, even if they're not able to respond right then because of staff limitations or they're dealing with another special assignment, um, it helps sort of track what the patterns are and then they can change their deployment of staff accordingly. Um, so um, I would, that would definitely help them. And, you know, you can always, uh, for, for people all the time forward complaints and issues to me and I send that to the Manhattan captain so they can deploy accordingly or for something pops up, which often happens, then, you know, and de depending on the magnitude of it, then obviously we have to adjust our plans to address the condition that has popped up. But so we have our, our regular sort of parameters and then we have to deal with conditions as they come up as staffing allows. Um, sometimes we find out about those things in advance, maybe a day or two, sometimes we don't. Um, so there has to be lots of flexibility um, but the more information that that division has, the better planning and deployment can happen. Um, but as many people know here, we have also been dealing with lots of pop-ups. Um, so that is, has definitely been a challenge on parks property, out in the streets, on Amtrak's property. Um, can you also speak to, cause there's, there's been, um, uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat about just sort of general uh, partying, large groups of people, there's trash, they're not wearing masks, there's, I mean, none of these complaints or observations are new. Um, what's the ongoing way of dealing with this? Because Right. So Park enforcement and um, social distance ambassadors that usually, you know, would, would be assigned to recreation divisions. Our, our recreation center right now, if people don't know, is a COVID testing site, one of our rec centers at, at Highbridge. Um, so some of the recreation staff have been serving as ambassadors, the urban park rangers, uh, we had some temporary social distance ambassadors, lots of education and mask handing out is being done. Um, that doesn't always mean that people comply, but the education and making the masks available uh, helps uh, in, encourage that compliance. Other times, if there's a large scale event, there's amplified sound and it's clearly uh, a safety issue, then parks or police have to come in and sort of uh, disperse that uh, gathering depending on you know what it consists of. Okay. 
Um, all right, I, I know that there are some questions from the from the committee, but we've got a couple of people who have been in the uh, in the public who have been patiently waiting with their hands up. Fortunately, it's a virtual hand, so nobody's circulation is dying. Um, but I would like to uh, recognize in the order in which I saw their hands raised, uh, Cynthia Auburn. One minute, question, what you got? Okay, so I've lived across the street from Inwood Hill Park since 1999. And every year conditions in the park grow increasingly worse. And this year, the litter has been prolific. Um, there's barbecuing all over the park, but what I wanna focus on is the noise and the ear splitting decibel level that we have been subject to. Swapped out sound systems in car systems, are replete on the streets adjacent to the park. There's um, a ton of amplified music without permits in the park, competing boom boxes. I haven't gotten a good night's sleep all summer long. And I would like to ask Jennifer if she could please come up with a plan with goals and milestones for addressing this situation. And we're all resource constrained, but we are still all held to the same performance standards we were all held to pre-COVID and it's becoming unlivable in the neighborhood. And I just would really like the parks department to please once and for all come up with a plan to put an end to this. Thank you. Before you address that, I just wanna, there's somebody else who threw up this essentially the same issue that's happening at Dongan and Broadway. And, you know, we, we know what the hotspots are and it's, it's continuing to be an issue. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Sure. And I, I would also, you know, the NYPD responds to the 311 calls about noise complaints. Um, they haven't so, been though, Jennifer, that's the thing. They have not been, did you say? We call the really? complaint in and two minutes later, it's closed down. So they're not responding. They may say they are, but they're not. And, and that's been raised at a community precinct council. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's, it's a huge problem. I know we have been, um, you know, when, when we're following the social media with the pop-up parties uh, and now with the pop-up tournaments, um, you know, there are, uh, divisions that follow social media to track things and helpful people in the community also sent give us heads up that that something's happening. Um, so we were able to prevent a certain large scale gathering on Saturday in a portion of Inland Hill Park, but I understand in another area of the park, you know, there was a another large scale event. So um, I think part of the you know challenge is absolutely is uh, being re having you know limited resources um and it's it's unfortunately not just in woodhill park it's at, at many of our other sites but i'm happy to go back to the uh the 34th and see you know i mean my only comment is that this doesn't seem to be happening in central park and riverside park and I'm actually going to stop you right there. I'm going to stop you right there, ma'am. It's absolutely happening in pretty much every park in the city. Okay, people well, that's people like that. that doesn't that doesn't mean it's okay. Mm -hmm. I, I don't. I, I say that not not to say that it's happening everywhere. So you know, deal Thanks with for that information because I, mean. I was unaware of it. But yeah, it's it's not it's not like every park has no problems and it's only happening here. It's literally happening in every other park, including okay. Central Park. I, I was unaware of that, Liz, so thank you for informing me. You bet. It, there was an article today about Washington Square Park and a big party that NYU threw, Cynthia. Um, mm -hmm. And then a few weeks ago, you know, Prospect Park. Oh, Prospect Park, Brooklyn, Queens. Right. Oh, so I'm not excusing it. And this is my community too. But I, I guess what I'm saying is, you know, it's, it's uh, whereas maybe it's been isolated before, it's much more broad spread. So okay. Okay. But if you get everything at once, it's definitely been a challenge. 
if you, Jennifer, um, and Steve, if he's still on the call, could reach out agency to agency to the NYPD, I, I feel like um, that would go a long way in the NYPD realizing that it's not just, you know, six people from the community that don't have anything better to do with their time than complain, that this is a real problem and that you as an agency need their help as well um, as an agency for them to uh, do their law enforcement job. Sure. But just to be clear, I don't know if you heard me earlier, we do work closely with them. We did just do a special operation this past weekend in response to some in intel we were given. Um, so I don't, I don't think they're necessarily, you know, the, the suggestion that they're shirking, I don't think is accurate. I just think- I didn't imply that. I mean, I. All I'm saying is that when we call 311, yeah, that will absolutely, yeah. Two follow minutes up. later, it's closed down, yeah. and you then know, I got to move on to other people. That's okay. Yes, Thank you. absolutely. I will follow up with that because that definitely seems, you know. Thanks a lot. Yes. Um, so I think that also addresses um, Jennifer Bristol's question about. Uh, had a similar question, although she did have, uh, she did throw out props to Parks, and she also had a question about the bingo players at Arden and Broadway. Um, what the is so the, uh, I, I, we don't endorse the bingo players at Broadway and Arden. Uh, they had been, you know, inside the playground before, and then because of the tree damage, they sort of relocated. <laughs> um, we'll continue to work on that. Um, as, as the larger scale event problem, you know, winds down, we hope with uh, um, If someone could just ask them to just clean up after themselves and to wear some masks, it wouldn't be yeah, tough. It would go a long way. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Tanya Bonner. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, um, yeah, uh, very quickly. I, I'm here to address uh, uh, noise issues and illegal uh, activity happening in our parks. Um, it has been, uh, as Cynthia alluded to, affecting uh, people's uh, health, uh, inability to sleep, um, and also people's mental health. Um, there are people in our community who are elderly. We have veterans. People have reached out. We have people who have to go to work. We have children. School is about to start. Um, how are kids supposed to get proper sleep and do their homework? I asked people, I reached out to some community members, though this was not scientific, uh, just to get some people information uh, about problem areas in the park. In Will Hill Park took the, took the cake for problems. Um, uh, most of the problems seem to be in Inwood, though there was about 29% of the problem parks were in Washington Heights. I can speak to McKenna Square being particularly problematic. Um, some of the illegal activity that is prohibited in parks included loud music with, with DJ type equipment, loud parties, drinking, illegal drug use, fireworks, large gatherings, uh, not to mention uh, so many other things. Um, I, I and this was all most of this was happening between 5 p.m. and 6 a.m. Uh, according to the people uh, that we spoke to. Um, uh, so uh, people are filing 311 complaints about half did half didn't but the reason the other half said they did not is because nothing ever happens just like Cynthia mentioned things are closed out within a few minutes people I know I personally contact the precinct specifically directly because I don't have time to waste on 311 um, and most people are not even aware half of the people weren't aware there's even a parks enforcement unit um, that is a, that should help with this issue um, so I, I, I want to say that this like as I said this has been going on for quite a long time I, I have an issue with it's happening in other places I have to say, I went to graduate school at Columbia University, and, and that's near 116th Street, uh, Riverside Park, and I can tell you, it, you can hear a pin drop at uh, 116, and all the way, that whole strip over Riverside Drive, you can hear a pin drop. I was not seeing parties. I was not seeing people doing liquor, shooting up, smoking weed. I was not seeing people having barbecues. I was not seeing any of that. And one day, a couple of times, I was sitting in a park 
and police pulled up and asked me what I was doing there. Because <laughs> I'm just sitting there relaxing, and I was asked why I was there in the, at night. Wow. Uh, I don't even know how to respond to that. That's outrageous. Um, this is going to sound like I'm passing the buck. I'm not. There's, we know there's a huge enforcement issue um, in terms of whether and how the NYPD enforces stuff and how, when, and where they deploy their resources to get a handle on some of these things. And although a lot of it, what you're articulating is happening in parks, it's the NYPD that's doing the enforcement or should be doing the enforcement or isn't doing enforcement. It's not And I know that this is a conversation that happened last week at public safety. Um, I don't really have anything to add to that. Liz? Yes. I just wanted to, um, I was actually just gonna mention that, um, that we talked about this at the public safety committee meeting the other day and I asked the officers if they always respond to every 311 complaint and they said yes um so i just wanted to mention that but also they mentioned they just reiterated that when they have competing calls they have to sort of triage and something like a robbery or burglary would be higher priority than um like a noise complaint for example but they say they say that they do respond to every call um they don't. Right. Just wanted to say, just wanted to report what they said during that meeting. Fiction. Um, I, I, I don't. I don't doubt that they said that. It is. It is true that they said that because I was actually on briefly on that call and I heard them say that, and. And I made it a point to ask if they always respond to every one one call and they- Yes, you did. <laughs> yes, you did. Um, so again, um, uh, Tanya is saying she got cut off. Can she- <clears throat> I'm not- Liz, sure why you're is not there, on, on that issue, I was wondering, do, when they do respond to 311 complaints, um, when they close it out, do they check out how it's done, how that follow-up is done? I can answer to that. Yeah. Uh, and we're, uh, myself and a few other people are actually going to be filing an FOIA about that. Yes, they, the, the officer, it is first registered you do it on 311. It is then sent to the precinct officer at the desk. The desk officer then sends it out to a sector car or an NCO, decides who to send it to. That is recorded in a computer so it is known who the officer at the desk is and who it is sent to. Then the person or officer that it is sent to then evaluates it, takes an action, and the, the officers currently have these like uh, tablets and special iPhones. And in those iPhones, they then record what action that they took, like unfounded or, you know, complaint resolved or whatever that they did. And so that also then is by a code of the officer's identity, which we will be pursuing in a few cases, especially these ones that are closed out in a minute. Thank you. Mary. Thank you, that's super helpful. Liz? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, um, so I, I had to do some questions. I wanted to know, 
of I understand that the you know police are supposed to be I just I'm just not clear on on who's supposed to be doing what and these are park rules that are being broken so parks can't be separate from what police are doing so police and, and parks need to work in tandem to deal with this issue um, and I, when I go to police precinct, the 33rd, they told me there's a park cross street, a party was happening. And I said, are you kidding me? Like this was three o'clock in the morning. And they said, well, the parks department is supposed, that's their job to, to handle that. That's what they told me. And that they feel like it's the parks department's responsibility to address those issues that are happening in the parks. And so I'm confused. It's a lot of passing of the buck. Well, it's them and it's not us or it's us and it's not, it's, you know, it's just, I don't really care who it is. I just want this problem addressed because as I said, I want some data that shows that Central Park and Riverside Park are having the same issues that we're having. I want some evidence and I'm going to ask for that data because I'm not okay. well, I'd like to speak to that. Can I, I would like to clarify? Okay. I'd like to speak to that first. First of all, when you compare this to Central Park, Prospect Park, or Battery Park, that's actually an unfair com comparison because they have conservancies where they have privately hired police. So under the city budget, we receive the same amount of officers per capita or per uh, park space that, for example, Central Park does but they augment that with a tremendous number of private officers that are hired through the conservancy. We are a poor neighborhood. We do not have that, um, other phalanx of officers that Central Park or Battery Park has. So that point made. Uh, the next point I'd like to make, yes, the NYPD is supposed to be in the park, Beware of information you get from the person who answers the phone in the precinct. That often can be a rookie officer who needs more training. Yes, the NYPD is supposed to be in the parks and it needs to be in the parks. PEP officers especially get off earlier in the day and the NYPD is supposed to be more of the uh, evening presence. They need to have bicycles that they have gotten in the last year to ride in the um, parks, uh, scooters, so that is not the case. Jennifer, I think you should take over maybe from there. Sure, just to make clear that crime is the sort of under the purview of the NYPD. Um, the peace officers that form the park enforcement patrol are public education. Um, you know, if you don't have a permit, they can issue you a summons. Um, they can issue a parking ticket, but if there, if it seems like there's a, a, a criminal element to what's happening, then that is uh, for the, you know, trained uh, NYPD or um, uh, agency. It's not our peace officers. So also, of, uh, uh, PEP officers do not arrest. Only NYPD officers arrest. This is correct. They also are not weaponized. Um, so depending on the size and type of condition that they're being asked to respond to, it may be more appropriate for uh, police officers or a team of police officers to respond to, uh, given you know the, safe, the safety of the individual. Uh, okay. Um, I'm not sure I keep, Tanya keeps cutting out. I'm not sure what keeps happening to her. Um, but I just had a quick question. Yes. It, it's not related to this at all, but um, it's just about Inspiration Point. Um, I know there was a large piece of debris on the left side of it. I don't know if that's been addressed. Is it is it uh, tree debris? No, it looks it looks like a. a large piece of furniture. It's probably about oh, roadway five or six dumping. feet across. Somebody pulled over on the side of the highway and dumped. Is that what you're? Uh, I mean, it's pretty far from the highway. I mean, it's un it's in the point. Yeah, it's. Oh, it is. Okay. So we'll take a look. Yeah, it was there. 
Yesterday, for sure. Okay. Thank you. We definitely, have unfortunately, had more illegal dumping at all of our uh, park perimeters. It was yeah. round, so maybe they did just roll it. Who knows? Okay. Yeah, construction, probably construction debris. Um, that's the way where more fly-by-night construction companies routinely dump in the parks in order to avoid uh, um, garbage cartage fees. It's a, a real ongoing problem for the parks. Pelham Park especially gets hit. It's a, a problem. Oh. And and a Highbridge Park along the Harlem River Drive, yes. uh, Dykeman Rest yes. um, by the one train, um, Park Terrace mm -hmm. West. We get lots of contractor dumping and restaurant dumping, um, and it impedes our ability. You know, our garbage trucks get filled with that instead of you know regular park trash. Mm -hmm. We're having to take all that to the dump on top of everything else. So it's definitely makes things more challenging than they need to be. So if you see someone looking like they're dumping, call sanitation, call the NYPD enforcement. Yeah, uh, Liz, I would like to make a comment to sort of sum up this discussion Tanya raised. Uh, yeah, we can we cannot expect the NYPD to, for example, go in with four officers and confront a group of fifty to seventy-five because that has a certain riot potential to it, but. It seems to me, especially over the next four weekends, which has been very effective enforcement in the past, that we know in Inwood Park that in the mornings, what seem to be semi-professionally organized gatherings, probably by DJs, promoters who have a good Twitter list or email list or text list, are organizing large groups of parties. They are bringing in beer on hand trucks. They're bringing in refreshments. They're bringing in professionally sized speakers and setting up outdoor parties. I mean, professional outdoor parties. In the past, we've also seen that on Fort George Hill. We've seen that at the edges of Highbridge Park by the Harlem River. What I would like to request is that the PEP and the NYPD be there at Indian Road in 207th Street along there Saturday morning, Sunday morning, starting at nine o'clock and confiscate the stuff. You're not allowed to have alcohol in the park. When they start to bring it in on the hand truck, it'd be confiscated. You're not allowed to have loudspeakers in the park, you confiscate it. That has been traditionally done in the past, has been successful. They're isolated at that point the party is off. The party is called off. That will be a tremendous service to our neighbors in Inwood so that they can actually use the park in these last weeks of summer. Because what's really happened is that the residents of Inwood have been, by and large, banished from the park. And these revelers and these, uh, this, you know, anti-social subgroup have taken over our parks to the detriment of our own community. So I really request that the PEPs and the police be there in the mornings through the afternoon of Saturday and Sunday and start confiscating. So I will say that um, the police setup across Dykeman Street has been incredibly effective in stopping that party before it starts. So this is a strategy that the precinct knows works. Um, and mm -hmm. yeah, so uh, I don't, uh, your point is extremely well taken. Um, I will work with Curtis to communicate that to the, um, to the precinct um, and to the NCOs. Um, Jennifer, if you could back me up on that, that would be really helpful. Um, Liz. Yes. I'm sorry, this may not be for us necessarily, but this was in the chat. Some people are asking about the uh, precinct community council meetings and most they haven't happened really since this started. Right. So the precinct community council hasn't really been meeting since COVID. Um, Barbara is a member of the precinct community council yeah. as is Elaine Grant, who's the person who put that up in the chat. The neighborhood coordination officers have been meeting, but again, I wanna make very clear, this is an important issue 
this is an issue that I care about and that all of the people who have been commenting in the chat and that we all care about. This is the Parks and Cultural Affairs Committee. And while a lot of those issues are happening in parks, that's a public safety, that's a different committee. So you can tell me that I'm passing the buck. I, I am not. Um, I'm trying to keep focused on what is the purview of this committee. So I think we've made really clear all of the ways in which this is a huge problem. Um, we still have uh, a very large agenda item to get through. So I would respectfully request that unless the question you are about to ask or comment you are about to make is something that has not been asked or said already to please yield your time. Well, Liz, you asked about the community council. It yes. was in March, it was canceled by one PP. Like, I'm the secretary of the 34th Precinct Community Council. We wish to continue it, but one PP canceled all the community councils around the city out of concern about COVID. There was also a hesitancy to allow Zoom meetings due to the fact of privacy issues, et cetera, et cetera. I hope that we will have our September community council meeting at least via Zoom. We will see, and I will be in touch with the precinct this week which also then will be raising the issues that I just raised. Thank you, I appreciate things. that. Um, and thank you, thank you, it's very helpful. Okay. Yes, Sally? Okay, I have some questions for Jennifer which are not related to the noise thing. Um, first is to reemphasize that we do, Friends of Woodhill Park has equipment that we can loan grabbers and gloves if people wanna do Cleanups. Um, second, regarding the masks, because um, that's a huge issue also, especially because we have the highest proportion or the fourth highest in the city of essential workers. Um, I participated with the MTA when they sent out the mask force all over the subway system and bus lines and stuff like that to hand out free masks. I wonder if we could consider something like that, maybe done it doesn't have to be done by the parks department, but it could be done in parks with the assistance of Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. So that's point two, sort of like a maybe two days um, and weekends would be best, obviously, because that's where the crowds are there. My third um, thing is just a thank you for getting the signage up um, almost immediately, Columbia and the parks after the first raccoon incident, which was with a friend of mine. And finally, just a question and a request to Jennifer. Um, I'm glad that the parks are open to the outdoor learning initiative. Um, I wonder if we could also, um, I know it's been brought up, I have seen at least one article, but consider using community gardens like the Ring Garden um, that they become part of the outdoor learning initiative as well. We have lots to teach, um, but as of now we can't hold public events. We would love to work with school children. So that's it. I'd like to say something briefly, if that's okay. Yep. Um, I don't want to start a debate and I don't want to be a contrarian. And I think um, I considered yielding my time because I know we have to move on. But at the same time, I feel that I must say, I must remind us that we are in the midst of a pandemic and people are not able to gather indoors. So they're gathering in the parks. And so I guess I want to push back against. Um, what was said a few moments ago about, you know, like heavily enforcing certain things um, and targeting people who are gathering in the parks, especially if it's daytime. Um, I can understand the, con the concerns around noise at the, in the evenings when people are trying to sleep like Tanya raised before, but I think it's just important to remember that parks are for people to gather, to have fun, to listen to music. And while it might not be our preference or the preferences of some to have these gatherings, um, that I, I just, I feel like I really need to push, push back against that, especially because um, our community is predominantly a community of color and this is where people are gathering. Um, I fucking love her. So, I just think it's really important to to remember that, especially also just another thing that's happening in the world right now is the 
killing of a lot of black people, people of color. And I think that's another reason why maybe the um, police are perhaps not necessarily enforcing these things because maybe potentially trying to minimize those sorts of uh, interactions that could escalate. So I just wanted to say my little piece. Thank you. And I would like to second the sentiment of everything that Danielle just said. Thank you. Thank you, Aisha. Welcome, another committee member. Yeah, it's um, it's a balance. It's a balance, and um, it's a balance. There are a lot of people who use the parks in ways that are not how other people might not might use the parks, and it's a balance. And we have to figure out how to. Um, use parks together. Um, I think Barbara's point is is well taken that there's there's an advantage to some level of being proactive uh, in a way that is not being punitive because yes, people should absolutely be able to use public parks, their public parks. Um, with that, I would very much like to move the agenda to the um, preliminary to preliminary discussion of capital and expense budget items. I'm just trying to see if I can screen share this. Um, Can you all see this? Uh, can you all see CB 12M Parks and Cultural Affairs FY21 Capital Budget Rankings? Is that visible? Yes. Excellent. Whoa, old dog, new tricks. Um, okay, so these are the... Um, the capital items from last year. Um, I'm gonna mute, somebody's got some background noise. So I'm just gonna mute everybody. Um, Jennifer, I'm gonna need you to tell me a little bit about some of these items. These are in the order that we had, that we discussed them, la that we had them last year, um, not in the, the, that we had ranked them last year. So can you just quickly walk me through which are the items that may have already been done and need to be moved to continuing support? Okay. Um, so the Nature Center is fully funded um, but that is a project that right now is in a holding pattern because of the Office of Management and Budget freeze on um, new expenditures. But it is fully funded, designed, has all the approvals. Um, Raul Wallenberg uh, is still in need. The basketball court renovation. Um, the the eastern portion of Ann Loftus Playground is not funded. I know that- Tell me which are the ones that should be removed because- oh, they're, they're done. Yeah. Okay. The Inwood Hill Nature Center though doesn't include displays or anything like that, right? That's just the building. There is funding for interior displays. There's not the funding for the sort of like rain gardens and learning gardens uh, that would, sort of retrofit the asphalt apron right. into more like learning space. So that is correct, yeah. We would need to include that just for the, for what's not included. Okay. okay. Um, these are all still needs. Okay, so the only thing that comes out is 
the nature center and if there's additional work that needs to be done in the nature center that would be a new item the landscape the learning landscape would be a new item yeah and i would propose we add that okay um and then on the expense uh and now in an email that i had sent out I had added, because typically what we do when we are looking at the, the capital and expense priorities is we take the previous year's list, we remove items that have been funded or for whatever reason are no longer relevant, they've been completed, they've been rolled into some other project, what have you. Uh, and then we add um, new items that have come up over the course of the previous year's discussion and anything else that we might wanna add. We will not be doing our ranking this evening. We'll be doing our ranking next month, but it's a lot to take in. So I like to spend some time at the September meeting um, talking about some of the items so that we can, you know, think about it, have some preliminary conversation, and then circle back to it next month. So we would add community, I think in your email, you said we could add, yeah. we would add the community garden. So among the, okay, I finally found my email. So what uh, I had rolled in based on a review of the meeting minutes from the previous year is urban gardening, including funding for possibly the space behind GW High School or some other space, um, but funding for a space for urban gardening. Um, and we do have, I mean, there's $200,000 that is somewhere that was already allocated. It might be recapturing those dollars. Yes, um, there was the discussion of some kind of equipment for better trash management in uptown parks. The, uh, several months ago, we had had suggestion about dumpsters and dumpsters aren't as simple as just dumpsters. If you're gonna add dumpsters, you also need the trucks that can pick up and empty a dumpster. So if that's a capital need that we wanna to add to our priority list, uh, that's something that came up in, in conversation. And then there had been um, the basketball courts on 186th Street and some repairs to that. There are some drainage issues, there are some paving issues, um, and uh, uh, the, the courts themselves are really kind of a nightmare uh, and they could use a uh, substantial overhaul. So based on a review of the last year, those would be the three projects uh, that had been discussed. And then there's the issue of the learning landscape. Yes, Jennifer. Just wanna clarify that there's about uh, 460,000 right now in the 186th Street Courts. Okay. And I think the projected estimate was something like 750,000, $800,000. Okay, so the estimate, that, so there's, you said 460,000? I, I think it's about that. And it's it's like a 750 or $800,000 project. So it basically needs an additional three, 350. The, the last time it was estimated out, yes. Okay. Um, now, can we ask about the state of certain structures now? So Liz, I'm not sure, are you paying attention to the hand raise in the Zoom or are we just- Okay, I, uh, I'm not gonna lie, because I was sharing screen, I, I can't see that. So I'm going to unshare my screen so that I can go back to that. Okay. And so now I have, I've got hands raised. All right, so uh, thank you. So we've got Aisha and then I'm gonna pull a uh, recognize. I, I have a question. 
Okay. Before I get to you, though, Daryl, I'm going to recognize Steve because I'm pretty sure he's got something relevant to say about capital. Aisha. So, um, it, from housing and uh, youth and ed, I was in the habit of seeing the register being used to be able to see what the city responded. I'm assuming that because Jennifer is here, maybe we don't need to use the register in order to make those comparisons. Correct. Okay. Um, that being said, can you walk me through the, 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 the reason why some of our parks, or I guess maybe all of our parks, I don't really know what it is, um, do or don't have cameras in them. Um, the reason why I bring this up is uh, because I had looked into it and I saw an article that stated something about bringing cameras to parks. Um, and the question came up because of the hanging that took place recently in um, Fort Tryon. So I was just wondering what is the actual answer as to whether there is or isn't cameras in some or all of our parks. And if there isn't, what is the justification for that? Um, I just wanted to know background because depending on what the answer is, then maybe that's something that I'd want to suggest. Heard an answer? Yeah, please. So um, most of the parks do not have cameras. Um, and part of that is because of the service contracts it requires. You, you need somebody to be monitoring it. Um, when Senator Jackson was a council member, I believe he gave funding for the NYPD to put cameras in problem areas to have tracking. I'm not sure what came of that, but that way, if anything is happening, you know, they could, they'd have somebody monitoring those cameras. They could respond. Um, so it's, it was more of a question of where did it make sense operationally and what was the most sustainable? Okay. Um, so I, I just want to say based on that, there's, AI technology now that has the ability to do surveillance without the use of a human. Um, and even to be able to make assessments on types of behaviors that it and, and quantify those behaviors and alert whoever based based on that. So that's something that can be put for consideration. Um, but yeah, thank you for the answer. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we can totally put anything anybody wants for consideration. Reasonable people can and do disagree on whether uh, cameras in parks are a good idea for the pub obvious public safety benefits or a bad idea for the equally obvious creepiness factor. So, you know, different people are just going to come down on that differently, but there's no reason not to include it um, as an item. Um, Steve? I'm gonna take you off of mute, um, but before you ask your question, um, I do see a question in the chat from Trish Anderton about shoreline preservation and bulkhead repairs. Wasn't that funded or is this a different section of part of shoreline? So if you could just offer some clarification either Jennifer or Steve on that item so I know whether I should be removing it or including it. Yeah, I, I think you should remove it because uh, uh, I can double check before your next meeting. But uh, I believe this is a project which has been funded by FEMA and uh, which, in fact, is already underway. Uh, so I'm, I don't think it needs to take up space on your list. Um, Thank uh, you. But, Thanks, Trish. But um, what I would uh, suggest possibly is that you might want to consider as a, uh, a long term item for uh, as a budget request, the uh, what we refer to as the lighthouse link the extension of the greenway uh, north of uh, the bridge, bringing it down into uh, into uh, the lower level of Fort Washington Park so we could have a continuous greenway along the river. Um, if, uh, I, I think that might be a, a, a beneficial thing to have and a, a legitimate uh, item for the community board. Um, you raise a valid point, and that is something that has been discussed previously, not so recently, but yes. Um, Okay. And, the, and the, the last thing I want to say is, uh, well, I, I have a couple of other things actually. Uh, on the, uh, uh, I, I would not um, uh, hold to that estimate for the 186th Street basketball court. Uh, that estimate that uh, Jennifer gave you is about a year old, and all of our estimates are going to go up uh, by probably six percent or more uh, as we uh, calculate for the uh, fiscal year 22 budget. Um, 
the uh, other thing I want to mention, I want to correct something that Barbara said earlier. Uh, there are no private police in uh, Central Park, Riverside Park, or Battery Park. Uh, there are uh, private police, I believe, in Battery Park City, uh, but that's not a, a city park. Uh, in Battery Park, there are no uh, private police. Uh, what Central Park has, we, uh, we have maybe four PEP officers assigned to that entire park. What they do have is their own police precinct. Um, Riverside Park also has a uh, unlimited uh, uh, detail of, um, of PEP officers. Um, the other thing I want to say is on cameras, I would not uh, recommend uh, making that a, a, a capital project request for your committee. Uh, we've had mixed experience uh, putting in cameras in uh, uh, Fort Tryon, I believe in Isham, in other parks around uh, Manhattan. Uh, and. Um, the reality is that it's much more effective, much more efficient if the cameras if the cameras are installed uh, directly by NYPD and are made part of the NYPD system. It doesn't make sense to have a camera here, a camera there, which is not part of NYPD. They then have to come over to us. We have to try to download the camera. Uh, it's, a, it's a much more efficient system if all the cameras are operated uh, by NYPD. So then if I'm hearing you correctly and um dovetailing with Aisha's suggestion, I can, in the same way that I will be communicating to the Traffic and Transportation Committee, the feedback earlier about the Margaret Corbin Drive, I should be communicating with Curtis about um, you know, this ongoing obvious issue related to enforcement, which is an expense item, not a capital item, um, but that there was interest um, within the committee to have uh, some cameras in certain parks areas uh, and that that be part of the NYPD's appointments. Yeah, and I would add to that decibel readers, the same sort of issue and shot spotters. I had an item and I'm not sure it did come up in meetings. I'm not sure where to put it. Um, which is um, more sort of sustainability things. It had come up when we talked about the baseball fields, mm -hmm. but having um, no touch, you know, like more modern, like bottle fillers, having no touch um, water fountains, and also um, having um, recycling dollars devoted to education and equipment so that we can recycle. I know that the pilot was a failure, um, but we can always do better. Um, when we do our cleanups, we actually do separate recyclables, but we have to take them out of the park. And I would like to see this committee advocate for both expense dollars and capital dollars to go into some sustainability initiatives. Okay. Um, just to respond to that, I, I, it's been our practice as a committee when we have um, capital items, capital projects, that we ask for bottle fillers and those kinds of um, updated, upgraded um, fixtures, but retrofitting existing, it's, it's way more efficient to just upgrade them every time there's a playground or, or a whatever whole project. So I wouldn't actually, it's not gonna be particularly efficient or particularly likely to, to happen if we just say we want new bottle fillers all throughout the system. As, yeah, as so would, the problem is when it's been brought up, it hasn't been included. I would request at a minimum that they be in our largest park, which is Inwood Hill Park. But I, I think it's a, I think it's unfortunate that they're not there. And I'm embarrassed as a member of this committee that we haven't pushed more aggressively for recycling. So right, I, I didn't get. I didn't get to recycling yet. I was okay. speaking specifically about bottle fillers. In terms of recycling, I'm totally with you. Um, and I and I think, and Steve can correct me, but I think that that should be a larger expense item through the Health and Environment Committee to address recycling throughout the district, including in our parks. But I think if we have like a recycling item about recycling generally and a secondary recycling item about recycling in parks, we're less likely to get what we want. We're more likely to get what we want if we have a single recycling item coming through Steve's committee. Yes? Yes, because it is it's up to the Department of Sanitation. 
Okay. So if they're I'm happy with that. dealing with the yeah. public safety or health uh, committee, rather, um, it should go there. Okay. Uh, okay. Am I am I still on? Can I say something? Yes, you are still on. Um, I, I think uh, Sally, the uh, we did include a bottle filler in the uh, in the plan for uh, Inwood Hill Park uh, ball field number one. Uh, yes, yes, we did, and it was and, not a fast one though. It was, what and the, you moved it out of the dugout. At one point, it was in the dugout. Uh, I can't tell you right now where it is, but I believe it's part of the plan, okay. and I believe we now, uh, as a standard practice, we included. I think in all of our uh, playgrounds, I know I uh, yes. I presented a plan to community board six last week and it was in the playground I presented yes. to them. Sure. But uh, could I, but as long as we're mentioning Inwood Hill Park ball fields, could I point out to you, Liz, that uh, you might want to um, include that as one of your uh, capital project items as well? Because at this point we have the funding to do three of the five fields. We're gonna need money at some point uh, soon to do the other two fields. Right, so that's ball fields two and four. No, no, it's, uh, I think, damn it, I think it's uh, three and five. Three and five. It's three and five. One, two, right, 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 okay. Or no, it's four and five. It's four and no. five that aren't done. Four and five no, no, that no. aren't done. No, no, what, two and four are part of the uh, plan with number one. You know I what? don't know, by, by next <laughs> month we'll figure, we'll, okay. by, by next month we'll figure it out. The other, for the moment, the other two, and there was, Certainly clear enough feedback. That's actually my bad for not having included that as an item that had come up um, previously because there was broad support for the for the one ball field and then for expanding it to the three ball fields. And many people asked, what about the other two? So yes, they should be added. Okay. And then uh, yes, Sarah. Okay, yeah. I just had some questions about possible and, and I don't know maybe what's best for Jennifer or Steve to maybe prioritize us or tell us where it is now um, in terms of repair or replacement of certain fixtures in the park. Sure. Um, one is the 181st Street uh, pedestrian bridge. That was one, then there's the other pedestrian DOT. bridge. That's, that is a DOT bridge, by the way. That's no, no, okay. no, 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 it's, no it's, it's our bridge, uh, but it's gonna be rebuilt by DOT. Uh, and, by DDC, yeah. Uh, well, DOT yeah. Well, I, I think it's a DOT pro project. In any case, it's uh, it is a fully funded project. Uh, it is uh, somewhere in the uh, pipeline. I've been um, I, I've been trying to find out actually whether or not it's being held up by OMB. And um, by the time of your next meeting, we'll get you an update on where it stands. Okay, I, but I as for now, we don't need any inclusion no, of it at this. Point. I don't think so. Okay, and what about the other pedestrian bridge in the east eastern side of, or like, the western side of Inwood Hill Park? It has not been funded by DOT yet. Do you think it's needed? It's It gets inspected as part of their bridge inspection program. We can check, um, but we haven't been approached recently about it needing uh, upgrades or over. And I was also wondering about McNally Plaza. That seems to be in some sort of disrepair at the moment. Do you mean McKenna? McKenna Square? I thought it was McNally by the bridge, by the one bridge. But McNally. At, a, at, 100, at 182nd and Laurel Hill Terrace? That's correct, yes. Oh, it's, first I've heard of that. Yeah, it's been recently repaved. Oh, some of the fixtures look like they're broken what what do you mean by fixtures it's benches um oh. there's a fence there around a, a sign okay we can take a look at that. Yeah, that that you don't have to list that as a capital project yeah probably not a capital probably just expense okay and what about inspiration point i know um it looks like some of it is chipped off the rebar yeah yeah the, stair the stairs will would need to be reconstructed uh, and is, is this a capital project or, or no? Yes. Probably. It's it's no. pretty deteriorated. The rebar is coming out. Any idea what that would so that would be inspiration point. Fort Washington Park. Yeah. And then the the last thing I had was for um 
get specific. So inspiration point what the 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 structure itself, the structure path structure itself. Um, you know, if, if we're gonna be if we're gonna be taking a capital look at it, we should just make sure that it's structurally sound because yeah. it's actually you're standing on what's the second story of it when you're looking out at the overlook. So underneath. Um, and then there's lots of spalling of the um, the staircase that uh, it's like three stairs that provide access to the brick patio, uh, mm -hmm. and they're pretty far gone. What would you really? call that? It's not a gazebo. It's a it's a portico. Portico. Thank you. Portico. Nice. Jennifer, something that hasn't been. And, I'm sorry, Sally. Sarah, I just have one more. I'm sorry. It, it was it was just the. Uh, I don't know what you call it. It's around 175th Street below that path that goes down just west of um, J Hood Wright Park. Haven Avenue. Yeah, that's uh, in really bad shape. The fencing and the path and all that there. Um, the lighting is working now, but uh, it, it whole area is constantly under construction. I don't know if you can tell. There's a temporary ramp right now, then there's the walkway work. Um, but is, it, is that ours? Portions of it. It's port, portions of it are Port Authority, portions of it are State DOT, some of it's City DOT, and some of it's parks. I, I would love to do a tour of that when we're able. Okay. Yeah. Thank, you, thank you for bringing up Inspiration Point. Yeah, it's the past year. It's really gotten much worse. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Um, Sally, you got something quick? Yeah. The other capital item. I know. Again, this is something that was supposed to be funded in year two of participatory budgeting, but um, free um, pit guards um, along Broadway and other areas, because I think parks invest a lot of money in trees that continue to die most of which I think are reported within the contracted time frame, but some of which are not. And I just wonder if we made a push for tree pit guards. Um, so are tree pit guards capitally eligible? If yeah. Yes, on, only for trees that have been planted within a two year time frame. And anything beyond two years, you'd have to use expense funding for it. I see. Yeah, because I know other districts have done it through participatory budgeting. I know like Corey Johnson's district. Okay. Um, all right. So these these items will be added. I want to just take a quick look at the expense items. Um, I'm going to screen share again briefly, during which I will not be able to see uh, raised hands. So uh, we did also have a question about non-parks items and I just want to remind people that we do have a capital item regarding supporting the uh, Hispanic Society and their accessibility. All right, are you seeing Parks and Cultural Affairs FY21 expense budget rankings? Yes. Okay. So we have six items, uh, additional, additional PEP, uh, forestry crew, increasing DCLA funding, um, increasing funding for various, it's a, it's a catch-all item, just increasing parks' funding um, for various different kinds of staff from playground associates to, um, uh, recreational associates, urban park rangers for a, the, a variety of the programming that they offer, um, funding additional staff for sanitation, maintenance and operations and horticulture, and maintaining funding to continue to provide six days of services for libraries, um, which I don't know if that's going to come out of our committee or come out of uh, education. Libraries seem to bounce between education youth and parks and cultural affairs. Um, from this conversation that we've had this evening and from conversations that we've had 
over the past year, I don't know that there's a whole lot of new capital items, uh, new expense items that aren't already covered under these six categories. I think these sort of are ongoing needs and are likely to be even ongoing or given the budget cutbacks. And I think that, you know, we're already seeing uh, the incredible um, detriment to people's quality of life when these programs aren't, uh, aren't supported. So. I was just curious, did, uh, did Parks Department get a uh, artist in resident from DCLA? I'm sorry, say that again. Did they get an artist in resident? Residence. Not that I'm aware of. Oh. Liz, I have a question about number six. Yeah. Um, do we want to think about including language about hours in addition to the number of days? Um. Because I feel like children, I mean, um, I'm just thinking about like after school and having a, a space um, for kids to gather. So, uh, you know, which the, the exact wording of the encapsulate encapsulized version of what the item is is less important than how we explain, you know, because because there's the item and then there's a little bit of an explanation of what the item is. Um, you know, sure, we could we could say six days of service at NYPL and after school programming. That certainly makes sense. Or like expanded hours or something like that. Or or maybe ex expand. I mean, use modern terminology. I think we should have an item that talks about the outdoor learning initiative um, because now it's not only after school but it's during school. So I would like to see some sort of item that talks about dedicating dollars to the parks department for expanding their outdoor learning initiative um, in parks and community gardens. Well, actually, we, we don't spend any money on this initiative. Uh, mm -hmm. This is money that would be spent by DOE. Yeah, that's, that's a funding item that's going to be coming from DOE. So it's not like I'm not agreeing with you, but I, that's going to that's gonna have to be advocacy through the Youth and Education Committee. So if someone wants to write one of those emails to Faye, Sure. Thanks. Right. Well, I tell you what, I, what, what I would ask if uh, is that your uh, item number five be uh, jumped to uh, the top of your list in in light of our budget cuts. Mm -hmm. uh, and and if you could uh, remain loose on this point, uh, because we may have to come back to you next month if the layoffs go through and uh, give you some other uh, uh, news on where things stand. Sure. with our staffing yeah i mean clearly the the specifics on this is gonna is gonna change a little bit when we have some more information um yeah so uh i mean at this point sort of frankly uh um uh, getting back our mno staff and uh and the, the rest of our basic uh, staff is more important for instance than uh, having a dedicated forestry crew uh, i uh i and then the and then having the uh, having some of the programming staff. I mean, we, once, we, once again, I, we're we're not we're not ranking these items, so I, I don't actually want to get into a conversation about ranking these items. Uh, I just want to make sure that what the items are is yeah. complete, so that when I send them out to people for their considerations for when we are ranking them next month, right. that we have a complete list. So I will be communicating to Faye about outdoor learning um, and what was that? Uh, somebody had some wording there. Yeah, expanded hours. No, no, that's that's related. I would say the outdoor learning initiative in parks, community gardens and other green spaces. Steve, with the invasive removal, cause that's, you know, that's an issue. Would that fall under that budget line? I mean, that request line, or is that why under we- Under five, it would fall under forestry crew. Okay. We would love- we, Yeah, that's, that's why I think we need it. With our avoidance of spraying and then the tree loss and the holes in the canopy, 
we have had a proliferation of invasives and we would absolutely love uh, more foresters to be helping us in Inwoods Forest and High Bridges Forest, Fort Tryon Park. Yep. Um, but, you know, it, the mm -hmm. general public priority, as Steve notes, you know, is is the trash and the park maintenance rather I'm than stop you know. sharing so that I can see if there if we've got raised hands. I have one more thing, Liz. Yeah. Um. So, uh, I saw that on one of the items, it's it specified like specific groups, like teens and. Um, children and mm -hmm. I would like to, I'm, I'm not sure if we want to have this be a separate point or just like kind of um, include uh, formerly incarcerated people as another group to target for programming. Um, sure. Because I'd really like to see us, the, the rate of incarceration is pretty high in our area and we have a lot of people returning from jail and I, um, I know that the the Fortune Society is around like 145th, but we don't really have, to my knowledge, very many opportunities for programming up. Right. Down. So yeah. I really see that, more of that. I, I would agree with that. And um, that is intended to be an extremely general item uh, so as not to micromanage how exactly parks um, does the best they can with whatever funds that they have. But I agree that that's an important um, uh, targeted group to add. So rather than having a new item, I would add that language to that item. I'm cool with that, thank you. And thank you. Okay, um, so I, th I think that's all of the added items. Um, I see I've got Jennifer Bristol. Okay. Uh Somebody's got a lot of background noise. I'm muting everybody. Uh, Jennifer. Hey there. Um, I just thought I wouldn't be doing my job um, if I didn't mention the dogs in our community and the dog runs or the dog run in Fort Tryon. And I know, you know, for the last few months, I've been thinking about, of course, we're never going to get funding because of, you know, the budget cuts in the pandemic. But you know what? I realized that during the pandemic and our close down, how many people were begging for the dog runs to open for various reasons, besides the dogs, it's a sense of community, people socialize there, they're safe there, their dogs are safe there. There are a lot of problems with dogs being off leash. So I know it's a lot of friggin' money, but I also think it's my responsibility since I've been on the call to at least bring that out to everyone's attention because we haven't done that for a few years. So that was it. Thank you for everyone's hard work. Thank you, and thank you for your uh, for your uh, comment. Appreciate that. Um, hold on a second. Let me. Uh, yeah, you can you can speak, Alexis. Uh, okay, thank you. So. I want to, Jennifer, I just want to let you know that there's been great initiatives um, helping funding in different parks, uh, dog run parks. And if you want to talk to me about that, I'm happy to talk to you offline. And the other thing that I was just concerned about because of the recent uh, storm where there was a huge tree tree branch that fell right into the porch of Marshmallow that now needs um, can we put another item in there because now that porch is really rotted and danger and starting to look yeah, so the, the tree limb was removed. The, to my knowledge, the tree limb did not really do damage to the porch. Everybody's muted. I can hear you. Yeah, that's that's correct, Jennifer. The yeah. the tree branch actually just it didn't fall on the porch. Over no, a series of, of days, the the weight of the tree um, had it resting on the porch. 
uh, and uh, there was really no damage besides some scraping of the paint. We are though, Alexis sending forestry back to do an assessment. They removed the immediate hazard. We wanna make sure, you know, particularly given how, how historic the house is that it didn't destabilize the tree in any way and that there isn't, you know, a potential threat of more coming down and damaging the house. Right, and regarding uh, the pending capital project, uh, the porch and woodwork it will be attended as a part of that. I'm sorry, Alexis, I gotta, I gotta mute you because I can't, you sound like you're talking from underwater. So uh, if you wanna shoot me a text or throw something into the chat, but I, I can't understand a word. All right, can you now? Try again. Can you hear me now? Ish. Okay. What I'm saying nope. is, I took pictures of the dam. It seems to have increased the rot. And I'm, all I'm asking is just to, I just would like to see if there could be funding to help fix that, extra funding to help fix that. That's all I'm saying. It's part of, I don't know if you heard Shiloh or if you were disconnected, but the porch will be part of the sort of exterior restoration of the house that's funded. But I'm just gotten worse. That's all I wanted to bring up. And I've been there because I've been taking pictures. That's all. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, so I, Liz, I have one more thing. Sorry. Sure. Um, I was just thinking about that boy that, um, drowned in the, um, call it, in the water. I can't hear you. Can you speak up? Sorry. I'm just, I was thinking about, I was just thinking about any other ideas that I had. And I, I thought about that boy that drowned in the water in Inwood Hill Park. There, there were two, two boys. The two boys, I'm so sorry. The two boys that John, I'm just wondering, as long as we're thinking about um, uh, projects and expenses and, and, and potential projects, is there anything that could be installed to try to prevent something like that from happening again in the future? So, so it's, you know, a worthy cause, but we have more than four miles of shoreline here. So it's not something that like capitally can happen. But what the Parks Department and the Department of Education and others have been doing, there's a program called Swim for Life, and they go into certain communities, uh, particularly communities of need, like, and in second grade, you have mandatory swimming. So like my son, you know, goes to school east of Broadway. He got the benefit of that program in second grade. Uh, Parks Department also does uh, in their rec centers, uh, learn to swim programs, but uh, more more opportunities and access for learning how to swim uh, is really key because the physical obstructions would be of such a magnitude that it would really um, hurt uh, sort of the the visual openness of our community. Concurrent with all that, the Marine Operations Division does at, at more sort of accessible entry points, Muscoda Marsh, the Dykeman Beach, where there's almost immediate access into the waterways. There are call boxes, there are like rescue rings um, and the park, part of the parks enforcement patrols tasks is to go and check to make sure all of that is still intact. The warning signs about no swimming so that there's, there's some uh, level you know, of deterrent uh, there. Um, and public education there, both in, both in English and Spanish. Thank you. Okay. Um, so there, there remain, you know, still some fairly large on it. I think, I think we're solid on the, on the capital and expense. I'll send out a revised list and remove the rankings, obviously. Um, 
so that we have them for our consideration and discussion next month. Um, there continues to be sort of the lingering uh, question and concern about the enforcement issue in parks, balancing legitimate use and the very compelling argument that Danielle made that Aisha echoed and that's been something we've talked about a lot in this committee before, as well as you know, people's legitimate need to have some peace and quiet and what is the parks department's role in that and what is the PD's role in that. Um, so, uh, you know, again, Jennifer and Steve, if you can bring back to PEP, I know that you have, that they have limited resources. There aren't very many of them and there's a lot of ground to cover, um, but, you know, we're, we're really struggling up here. And um, it's, it's, it's frustrating to keep on having the same conversation. And then, you know, it sort of goes away when the weather gets cooler and then it's a problem again the following spring. So it's a little bit exhausting, literally, for those of us who aren't sleeping. Um, and I don't really know how to solve it. We agree that it's important We'll take it back. Um, might be helpful to have Inspector Harris from PEP come back next to your meeting next month. Uh, report on you know what they are doing, what they have been dealing with. Is it possible for her to get? I mean, I don't want to make work just to make work, but is it possible for her to provide you know monthly some kind of just snapshot of what the staffing looks like and what the deployment looks like so that we can just say, look, here are the resources that we have and here's how they've been used in this area. We can request that, yes. That would be helpful. And that way, and if she provides it, if she's able to provide it, then you know she maybe doesn't have to sit in a two and a half hour meeting. Um, yeah, well, that would be good. But uh, re realize in terms of deployment that uh, they're moving around all day long and traveling from one park to another. They're not for the most part, you know, fixed post in any particular location. Correct. Except, so, except for special operations, like at right. Dyke Fields this weekend or an overnight or, yeah. yeah. But in the same way that it was useful for, I don't remember who, I think it might've been Cynthia, but whoever it was um, to whom it came as news that um, the problems that we're seeing in the parks up here are problems that people throughout the city, throughout the five boroughs are seeing in their parks. She did not realize that, you know, like many people, what she knows is what she knows. So if all you see is the hot mess that is your local park in Inwood or Washington Heights, and you don't know that this is a condition happening elsewhere. Um, yeah. Yes. So I think it's it would be helpful to, to have monthly data from, uh, from PEP saying, these are what our resources were. These are where they're, they're being deployed. These are how many summonses we issued. You know, whatever their data points are, I'm sure people will also have questions and it would be helpful if she could maybe be here for part of the meetings. Um, but it would, there's probably some information that she can give us pretty economically that would be enlightening to us and not a terrible add to her workflow and not a huge commitment of her time. Noted. Fantastic. Okay, my goal was to be done by 8.30 because my goal really was to be done by nine and we only missed that mark by 10 minutes. So uh, I can't read lips, but it sure looked like Sally said motion to adjourn. Is there a second? I second. Fantastic, thank you very much. I appreciate you all. Um, I'm going to leave the meeting open for a couple of minutes so that I can continue 
pulling comments out of the chat to forward to my colleagues and other committees, but uh, consider this meeting adjourned and I am turning off the recording. Can, Can I you save the chat? Is there a way to save it? I don't know how. Okay. Yeah, I guess it's the q and I think we, you can cut and paste it. Someone. That's what I'm working on. Yeah. Cool. I'm not sure what they do. It's so hard to hear you. I'm sorry. It totally sounds like you're calling us from a waffle under the ocean. <laughs> so you want to wrap it up the meeting? Uh, yeah, just hold on. Just well, somebody be you just stopped recording. Underwater Ebenezer, would be me. Oh, wait, stop. Ebenezer, I, I stopped recording because the meeting is finished, um, but I still have the, uh, I haven't ended the meeting. I've adjourned the meeting, but I haven't ended the Zoom because I was just cutting and pasting the chat. So I need another couple of minutes to do that because I don't know how else to save it. And um, did we say welcome to the new member? Sorry. Oh my God. Uh, you know, I, I did welcome. say welcome. I did welcome. say welcome. Yay. Uh, to uh, Barbara. I didn't welcome Etta because she wasn't on the call at that point, but welcome, Etta. So glad that you were assigned to this committee. Uh, thank you. I'm really excited to be part of this committee. I look forward to working together. And happy birthday to your husband. Thank you. All righty. And I think I've got... Okay. I've got all of the comments from the chat, so I'm going to um, leave the meeting. Okay, thanks guys. Thank Bye. you, have a good one.